Are we ready? Give everybody a little bit of time here, I think. Okay. Point at me when I should start talking. <laughs> well, I think usually the host um, you may have to let people enter the room. I'm not sure how it actually works if they just started showing, because I'm now showing six to 11. You know, they showed that just, just recently logged in. Sometimes you got to click and let them. Yeah, that's just for a meeting. Um, okay. As soon as she hits start webinar, they'll start filtering in. They're all just sitting in a waiting room right now. But for a meeting, you're right. That's the way it goes. Are you waiting for people, Michaela? We've only got five it shows on there right now. So yeah. eleven. I show eleven participants, but that probably includes us. I think that includes us. Yep. Yeah, so we've got a couple people coming in. So whenever you guys are ready to start, uh, feel free to go ahead. Right now. Uh, good afternoon. Thank you for joining us for our second uh, market development webinar. I'm Ginny Black and I chair the um, Minnesota Compost Council. And um, I will, Chuck Joswak will be um, moderating the session. So I'm going to turn off my mic and just listen to the presenters. Um, and he will tell us uh, how we will be handling questions. And um, Again, I'm, I'm so appreciative that you are all very patient. We were learning this time all the ins and outs of trying to put together the, the webinars uh, access and it was um, a little rough. And some of you ended up having your uh, notices go into junk mail. So I, if, you know, I recommend you check that uh, periodically because that happened quite often. But anyway, Chuck, why don't you go ahead? Sounds well, great. Thanks, Jenny. So uh, once again, we'd like to thank all of our sponsors and uh, you can see all of those sponsors on the back of Jenny's uh, picture there that she had on. Well, that is gone now, but um, thanks to our sponsors. Um, this is the second webinar that the MNCC Market Development Group has hosted. Uh, I am part of that group and uh, we really appreciate you all coming today. Um, today's topic is on compost use and specifications. Uh, if participants need to change their names, they can go into that participant uh, uh, button at the bottom of their screen and go up and click on their name and put in their name. Everybody, kind of, a lot of people came through as the MNCC members with the way that things were signed up for. Um, and today we will be ask, we will have the ability to ask some questions. We ask that you type them into the Q and A into into the bottom of your screen there. Uh, we will actually be taking questions during the presentations. Um, we have a couple of uh, presenters here that uh, are, are fine with that. You won't throw them off track too much. Uh, we've got a couple of great presenters here today. Uh, a couple of guys that know a heck of a lot about compost and, and its uses. So uh, I, with that, we'll, we'll, start get, we'll get started here. So with that, uh, usually the guy that you want to have speaking right after lunch is uh, Dwayne Stenland. Um, from the Minnesota Department of Transportation. Uh, Dwayne is a certified professional in erosion and sediment control, and he holds an adjunct teaching position at the University of Minnesota in the Biosystems and Agricultural Engineering Department. He's worked in that capacity for, he's worked in the capacity for the Minnesota Department of Transportation for more than 23 years, and is involved with design, construction, and maintenance using ecological and sustainable based technologies to solve dis difficult soil and stormwater quality problems. 
He has presented extensively over the United States on stormwater management techniques and yearly at the IECA, International Erosion Control Association Conference. He has a master's degree from the University of Minnesota in plant biology and extensive work in bioremediation of poor soils and naturalizing plant community systems. Wow, that was a mouthful there, Dwayne. So uh, welcome. Thanks. I've had a lot of opportunities to work with Dwayne in the past, and I tell you what, he knows his soils. So enjoy the presentation. All right. Well, thank you very much for the, the invite. Um, it's an interesting day because I'm also um, at the International Erosion Control Conference that's, that was supposed to be held in uh, Kansas City. So I assume you can see one screen and I assume you can hear me. Is that all true? Yes. Here, just fine. Yep. All right. Uh, thank you. Um, so this picture that I show you, it's if you get a chance to go to Henderson, um, this is a large, uh, what we call a cellular confinement system. You wouldn't know it, but we couldn't make the, the, the road wider. And this is a flood re uh, restoration project because of the, you know, in Henderson, when we, in Minnesota River continues to flood, we lose this, the town access, but we couldn't impinge onto the wetlands on both sides. So basically we've got a, almost a vertical wall here, but it's built out of, uh, looks like an accordion um, stretched out. And then, uh, you know, in theory, a sand compost mix, which didn't work like it's supposed to. So you're building a vertical wall. The slope you see here is facing north, so the plants weren't adapted to shade like they needed to be. But this one was in compost injected over the entire thing. So we took a blower truck and, and basically injected into the little cellular steps. And I'm finally getting a better Chia Pet um, expression here. And there's a small area that is still not growing. And this isn't to be growing at all. This is a, a different cover. But this was supposed to be growing, and it still hasn't. But you know, given the, the length and the, and the height of this wall, it's still pretty darn good. Um, and it had to be lightweight, because you don't want to put a lot of load here and worry that the bridge or the the fill would tip over. So it's an interesting uh, retaining wall on a living plant material as opposed to a concrete um, wall of some form. So you know, I'm told that, we're that I'm supposed to talk about use and specifications. And like most things, um, you know, that would be the goal, uh, would be to talk about use and specifications. But I'm just starting off with a few ways that we illustrate in the plan. And uh, you don't have a copy of this yet, and you probably can't see it anyway. But I have uh, one through 21 topics I'm trying to go through as examples of how their how products for compost are used and shown in a plan or specified. So one of the more common BMPs that we use is uh, what's called a sediment control log type compost. And I have it bolded up there. And we show in the plan for the contractor where it's supposed to go. Um, and this is assuming that we get a uniform material. But one of the things I can tell you lately on sediment control logs is that it must be slightly more money than the wood chip logs. So I see a lot of what I'm gonna call fraud, um, which means they're substituting a wood chip log instead of the compost log as shown in the contract. Um, so one of the things that you as an industry could help me would be, um, how do you determine without cutting a log open, which is the right one? So I'm actually proposing to have a different sleeve cover um, out of it. And I know Filtrex might use a green color, but most of the Minnesota companies that have a valid product are using the black geotextile sleeve. But somehow, so does the wood chip one have a black colored sleeve, and it's not enough to differentiate. Um, and those that know can, can readily tell, but those that don't do this for a living, you know, just part of an inspection team, contractor team, or engineer team, you don't always know what they're getting. It looks like it's a log and it looks like it's placed in the locations as shown on this tabulation sheet for, you know, they call it erosion control, but it's really sediment control. And like all things, we live and die by um, uh, details. And I just want to show two items here. Uh, this is the same detail that would be for wood chip log, compost, sediment control log, or rock, but the compost one. And just to give you a sense that there's about 0.35 cubic feet per foot of this log being installed. And if I use a compost um, berm, which is one of the choices that you see here, that's about 0.23 cubic yards per foot of run based on the detail. So it gives you a sense of uh, you know, the quantities per lineal foot of fill you know, for these perimeter control items. Um, and again, most things don't look exactly like a four foot wide, two foot tall, and this kind of moundy, roundy thing. It doesn't look exactly like that in the field. It's much more sloppy looking, but you know, that's how the drawings come out. 
And like anything else, we need to show the contractor where they go. So in this case, we might have a symbol that says BR, which would be a uh, sediment control log, and that's MnDOT's term, and type compost. So there's a bile row is what the BR stands for, but it's really called a sediment control log. But just to show that on wetlands, so that you become more knowledgeable yourself, is that when we're working within 50 feet um, and inside of that buffer zone to the water, we're supposed to have two of something. And generally, it would be something like silt fence or a compost log, which could be a wood chip log, but usually it's a, a compost log as the second piece, five feet away from the first line as part of our sediment control redundancy that's required um, in the permit. And this is just an example when the project is now um, nearing what in theory be, this would be the end point where you're using permanent you know, stabilization items. But uh, just to give you a sense that these logs are intended to stay behind, we'll still cut the sleeve open and leave that organic material um, there. We don't really want more microplastics in the environment. So we're getting much better at, re in theory, removing the synthetic materials that are not really decomposable. And if we use a bio log in construction for linear projects and it's a, an organic net, it probably doesn't last long enough to get it off the pallet. So I'm going to start here and it really starts with what we're talking about. Um, in my world, um, I've really got two kinds of provisions, grade one and grade two. Um, the three quarter inch screen is the most commonly used and specified one. Um, it doesn't mean that the particles aren't longer than three quarter inch, just that that's the screen size. And I need it rougher to actually perform the erosion control practices that I'm going to talk about. And I'd also uh, let the audience know um, that you can interrupt and ask a question at any time. You can go through Michaela if you want, but you can interrupt me because I'm the only state employee that I'm aware of that is able to speak without thinking. So you can't interrupt the thought that I have because I haven't got any, um, which is, you know, I'm just sort of making it up as I go. And that's why I hurt everyone's feelings because apparently I say things that are just so sensitive now. Um, it's getting harder and harder to find humor anywhere in my job or in America, but I still think um, humor is very important in the marketplace. Um, and I happen to think that compost is funny. We do funny things with it. And I think compost has a humorous you know, mode to it. And then the other stuff, if I were to get a very finely screened material, just to let you know, we'll call it screen and pulverize, and I do need it. And that's for infilling what we call turf reinforcement mats. So you don't have this one, but this is an example of a handout that uh, at some point you may want to email you know, Chuck or Jenny or Michaela or somebody and say, I'd like to know more because this represents a kind of a, um, and I've actually had to add to it because I missed, I think, three items. But uh, what pay item we have, what material spec drives it, how much would be grade two, which would be uh, leaf and grass clippings or SSOM type material, or grade one, which is a fertile uh, uh, feedstock from uh, you know, animal manures or animals themselves. So one is more protein based, the other one, you know, animal protein, the other one is heat, plant protein and other materials. And so I'm trying to show that if I have a grade two that's used for plant stock, 100% of that um, is grade two type. When it, and again, it's a kind of a broader range now of acceptable materials within the grade two. It's still plant based, but the material could come from plant food that humans didn't all eat or from processing of carrots or I don't know, lettuce or something. Um, and, then, and then it's really trying to say a bit, which ones do we use a lot of, or now I'm gonna try to talk about which ones we are not using enough of, or in other words of saying where there might be market opportunities um, to start in your case, uh, I would say marketing more on how you'd fit in to using these things. And there's some that, I'm, that I've listed here, this muck salvage, I'm not gonna say much about it, but it doesn't have any compost in it, but I'm trying to be smarter and using the site-based conditions. So if I already got a lot of muck soil, your know, peaty soil, we're going through wetlands, for example, to use that um, rather than importing um, something else or calling the muck to be you know, not usable or suitable. But anyway, this just gives you um, the, the, the specification, the pay item, uh, what it's typically spec for, specified for, what we might call it, because um, it's all about language. Uh, than the operations that it might go in. So my intent is to try to get through each of these 21 subject matter, if you will, not all of them have many slides, but just to show you, you know, how we're using them at the Minnesota Department of Transportation and counties. Um, and there seems to be quite a push to get carbon sequestration in, um, the idea of, of uh, you might say carbon banking, CO2 banking in soils. Um, 
and being more sustainable. So the first one is just to look at uh, landscape beds. And in my opinion, this is at market saturation. This is just using raw compost and using a machine. In this case, we do specify the spading machine to properly incorporate it into 12 inches of a, of a rooting profile. Um, we're not doing you know, twice the amount of landscaping beds. It's really a function of, of how many roads we build and we're not building that many roads um, anymore. So I don't see this as a huge market opportunity um, in your business. Um, we'll still have some, it just won't be, it ain't gonna be doubling every year. I just don't see that at all. It's, we've reached what I consider probably the peak, which is another way of saying feast and famine. Some years we need a lot for landscape and another year won't be an, a, a thing used at all. Another use that people don't realize that we have in MnDOT spec is uh, the protection of vegetation investment. And I show you really bad pictures here. These are all severely negligent. And that is we're compacting the roots, we're staging on the roots, we're building on the roots. We actually have a detail that says build bridges. And, and interesting enough, uh, putting a layer of compost, maybe something else on top of that, one of the drivable mats, it's one of the ways to maintain air to the soil and minimize compaction. So think of it as building a bridge out of compost. And I believe this is an emerging market because we're, our projects are getting tighter and tighter. We call that footprint to build in. And I really think there's gonna be a much larger opportunity to use compost, even though it's permanent, temporarily to create uh, buffers, you might say compaction buffers above the cells we're trying to preserve. And when we're done, we just leave the compost behind. Um, so it seems strange to abuse compost, but this is what I'm actually proposing is to use the sponge-like characteristics, the air flow characteristics and the water flow characteristics of compost to help keep our woody investments alive when I know we've got to stage stuff somewhere. The picture in the upper right, by the way, that is really pure negligence. Um, they pushed a work pad in here and that's multi-feet deep. These trees are all toast. They just don't die right away, but there's no hope for putting three to five feet of fill on a tree during construction, then stage on it and have any hope of it living. And yes, I'm pretty sure when we nick trees severely enough, we girdle them. But the point is that I think we this is what I would consider an emerging market to build, you might say, soil bridges to do construction. And I don't see this to ever grow again. And these are the, um, what I'm going to call compost filter berms. I haven't seen one of these for years. Uh, we're using instead topsoil. We're supposed to preserve all topsoil. And Chuck, you might recognize these pictures. These are, this is an older one, but I haven't seen a compost berm uh, for a long time, even though I have a 2020 project that did specify it. In other words, I'm using top host, uh, topsoil to build berms. I'm not importing compost in those cases. They'll come in on logs, but not here. So I wouldn't consider this a growth market, even if we've got a pay item for it. And I know that Filtrex and and others have got wonderful pictures. I would love to be able to use more of it. I just don't see it. Um, I don't mind being wrong here, people, but I just don't see much of an opportunity for this to, to be a market growth area. Um, they really do work. Um, they're re really pretty good about how water will go through them and retain the sediments. And I'm now talking about sediment control modes of action. And one of them is filtration and compost is part of that sediment control mode of action by filtration. So you got sedimentation barriers and filtration plus four more. But anyway, they do work. I just don't see any growth potential here. Um, it's kind of too bad. Um, Semi-permanent stormwater berm filters. This is another option that I've seen and I, this is built. This is on Como Avenue on just west of 280. Um, and this is a large stormwater treatment. And we basically built, as you see here, uh, a large, what looks like a gabion basket-like thing that's filled, and you can see it in the background here, filled with a compost filter media with the intent to take the pollutant load off, let's say, Hennepin Avenue and 280, and filter through three of these systems that are designed to open up the lid and replace the media that's spent at some point. Um, tremendous amount of labor. I can't imagine these really growing, even though they're really effective. Um, some might say that I release phosphorus, but in terms of pollutant load reduction, these you might say changeable filter speed bumps for stormwater. So they basically cause sediment to be uh, and stormwater to be detained in here, go through this filter on its way out um, ultimately to the Mississippi River down on uh, 94 and the other end of 280. But I just don't see a lot of um, potential growth here, which is kind of too bad. But anything that's really high labor and really expensive, not the compost, it's just the process to install these things usually is the death of them. Um, and this is one of the big ones where I think there's the, the market has only begun 
Um, and this is the sediment control log type compost for sediment control. They're fantastic in wintertime. You put them right on snow, they'll melt right in. We use them on rocks and trees and all sorts of dumb things. But from an urban perspective, as I show you here, we don't want a trench in silt fence. Um, and the point is, I don't want to trench in silt fence and kill the roots or cut in, uh, in, into utility lines and things like that. So I see a huge growing market on sediment control logs. So this is where I, instead of berms, this is where I see the market going and being more clever. And the point is that when I'm done, these soils are already salted and junky anyway. You're having a little bit of compost thinly spread on here is actually a benefit for uh, the urban health of our uh, invested uh, trees and boulevards that we have all around. And this is one of my first projects uh, a long time ago with Windscapes. And this was using the compost logs on a project way up north by the Fall River, um, just before you get into uh, Grand Marais, um, and using that in a, in a project where, again, you couldn't put silt fence in if your life depended on it with all these goofy rocks. At least I think it'd be really silly to bring a machine or have to dig this in. And instead, we use these. And um, again, when we're done, we just slice them open and the compost stays behind. So one of the attractive pieces to me, as opposed to silt fence, um, is that there's a lot less plastic being used in the first place. It's still being removed, but there's just a lot less of it. And I think it's easier to use these things that are held in by gravity than it is by trenching, because nobody really wants to dig these things in, particularly if you're dealing with frozen soil. So I see an opportunity here of growth, um, unlike a lot of the other practices that we have. And one of the neater things is that I'm using compost logs on barges. I'm using them on bridges. This is the St. Croix River Bridge Project. This is nestled behind the dock wall access. Um, water does leak through this, the interlocks of sheet piling, but this is actually to treat the water, filter the water before it goes into receiving waters. And again, one of the blessings are um, being able to use them in wintertime, put them right on snow because of their color, they melt right in and they're ready for the spring melt and surges that are occurring today, for example. And then using them in crazy ways, and one of the big crazy ways is uh, for concrete management. Um, I'm using them to absorb the concrete slop um, during construction, and those are then landfilled and thrown away. So just more examples of the flexibility. I've been able to take these logs with different sleeves. I really prefer the ones that are porous, not the silt fence. But you know, early on, people are trying all sorts of things these because this one has actually a grab flap so you can move it out of the way, do some work behind the curb and plop it back on and preferably right on the curb line um, because we're supposed to have down gradient perimeter control to protect our inlets. And if it's open to the public, we don't always want inlet protection in a traditional manner. We just don't want the dirt to get to the street to get to the inlets. But uh, from flexibility where I'm supposed to have redundant BMPs, this is where I see a lot of growth. And just as an example, I'm on a barge in the middle of the St. Croix River we're doing test shaft drilling and uh, an example of using this to deal with a slop that comes up from the drills that are in this case, um, a couple hundred feet deep into the river bottom uh, through about 20 feet of open water before you get to the surface again. It's just to deal with the slop management so it doesn't end up in the water. And what I like about the compost logs is just for the fun of it, that if you've been to Las Vegas and I assume some of you have, I'm using that as my sediment control method so that whatever happens in the barge, and I'm sure if you were in a live audience, you'd be thinking to yourself, hey, I bet he means that I'm not supposed to, you know, lose it. So whatever happens to the barge stays on the barge. That's the mantra that I have. Um, and again, just show you another picture of winter, which is cool. Um, this is our demonstration project years ago. And another area that's underutilized, in my opinion, is living filter slope breaks, slope diversions. And the intent is, even though this is a very non-erosive material, would be to have these things in a Chevron flow that would go to an area that would be kept stabilized, or if this slope was, a, let's say, a two to one, that this would be installed in a 20 to one. So it's basically taking the water and directing it, directing it to the edges. And I'm getting more and more projects that are doing that as a slope break. So instead of the water keep accumulating down, it's some of it is diverted to the left or to the right uh, during construction. So this is still part of a growth potential, as you'd see here on one of the projects, is to try to make sure that the silt fence doesn't fail. So using more of these things as slope breaks to filter the water, capture the sediments, you know, lots and lots of little, you might say speed bumps for stormwater rather than pretending I can dig it out of the ditch, dig it out of the pond and get it out of our receiving waters. It makes sense to do more, what I'm gonna call source sediment control. And again, today you'd never know that these are there. They were sliced open, the material kicked around and plants grew up through them with no problem. And I do have a detail sheet as an example, whether it's a, a compost log or a compost berm, as the idea of using slopes as slope breaks, 
I do believe these are not specified and used as much as they should anymore. Um, and mainly because the permit said, um, uh, permit cycles ago that you couldn't have a slope longer than 100 feet without a slope break on it. And then when the permit got rid of that, then of course we got rid of all slope breaks. Funny thing about how laws work. And this is a project that uh, again, Chuck might remember, it's a long time ago. Um, and this is a project that's it's been done for many years. It's still one of the coolest projects on planet earth. Um, and this is using the properties of compost to be a sponge. So what you see here is the entire stormwater pond on the um, restoration of a pathway that used to be part of Trunk County 61 on the North Shore. So this is by one of the tunnels. Um, it's still a beautiful place to walk, but we use compost for speed bumps. So all the stormwater from the entire drainage area is, is designed to be abstracted into this area that's also designed to be the butterfly, the native plants, you know, all the stuff that's indicative and, and appropriate for this area along the North Shore. And it worked. And I know it's working because we still have almost zero water ever recorded out of the centerline culverts that might take a drainage right here and go across. Water doesn't even get there. This stuff absorbs it like a great sponge. And this is just a couple of uh, inches. So if you ever get a chance to stop at the Silver Cliff Creek rest area or the parking area, walk down this pathway once and you won't even know what we did here. But that's basically the compost stormwater treatment pond. It's not a pond in a traditional manner. It's just using the greenscape um, with more than one function for water quality. And it's just kind of an illustration of the number of speed bumps. That's what these little black stripes represent. And then this whole area is nothing but compost uh, with the intent of absorbing all the water where it falls rather than pretending that I could ever clean it up out of the receiving waters. And this one is still one of my favorite pictures. I'm still haven't gotten a lot of these built. I'm getting interested in it at MnDOT, but in terms of a growth would be to take these sediment control logs and put them in stacked walls like this. So this is point number 21. This is a special revision, but it just kind of fit with the uh, sediment control log technology. And there's a lot of other companies, uh, people that are trying to sell me sand and compost in a bag and you stack a bunch of bags. And this is, we've been doing this for years and years now. But you know, the industry has tried to change the rules, but I still think this is one of the more elegant systems that allow water in and grow living chia pets on slopes. Um, so I still like this idea. And I think there's a huge growth potential um, to be able to build living stack walls. And we might still have to have geo grids that tie these back into the slope. So it, it's basically a superficial green space. It's not necessarily holding up the slope. This one's flat enough or you know, not too steep that this will work just by a gravity wall but we can still use the same things even on a 70 degree wall, which would be a bit more you know, steep in here than what you'd see on this slope. But here's one of my favorite uses of sediment control logs type compost is we do a lot of concrete demolition and believe it or not, this is one of the best BMPs for slop management when you're saw cutting bridges apart, railings apart as shown here. And uh, these compost logs are very absorptive and are still one of the best purifiers I have. And we know it's working because you start with a sediment load that would be unbelievably high for turbidity load and relatively clean water comes through. And uh, this is still widely used, just that we don't do a lot of you know, partial bridge rehabilitations of taking decks apart or railings apart. Usually it's just a total takeaway, you know, take the whole thing down, but still a very elegant solution and still one of the best of the best BMPs for concrete slurry cut management. We certainly don't want that concrete juice into our wetlands, rakes, and wetlands and, and rivers, I should say. So another one is uh, the five, the engineered manufactured soil. I do believe this is a growth area. Um, and I don't think we're, we're you know, understanding this well enough. My favorite soil, by the way, is the organic topsoil borrow, which is 50% compost, 50% of the in-place soil. But basically, this is an, these are engineered soils to do something, rooting topsoil. That's what it means. It's designed for boulevards or for planting beds. We have boulevard soils that's very similar. It's just a, a different kind of composition. Um, but the intent is to foster roots in boulevards in areas where you want deeper roots to go in so that this is a little higher sand to force the plants to go deeper into the water table. This one, we just don't have a water table. So that's why there's less sand in it. And then this idea of filter topsoil borrows what we use for our filtration infiltration beds. The compost then varies um, between 10 and 40%, depending on, because we have to maintain flow. It has to be greater than 1.6 inches an hour and not to exceed 8.3. And so we have to judge, you know, juggle the relationship between sand and compost uh, to make sure that we, first of all, get the flow rate through it. So different sand properties change flow and even different compost sources change flow. So we have to basically do testing before it's placed 
to make sure that we've got the right ratio that ensures the drainage more so than the ratio of compost. So you'd say, oh, great, 40% compost. Well, that's rarely used. Usually it's about 15% now compost and 85% sand has been usually delivering um, the right flow rate with the variations in sand and the variations in compost that you'll typically find in the marketplace. Um, here's an example where the rooting topsoil would be used. It's a landscaping area. Um, and this is the Hastings area. So if you haven't been there, it's a beautiful area, a new bridge. Um, and this is where the old bridge used to be. And this is all a landscape park. And this is intended to root these landscape shrubberies and other plant materials in, um, as you see here, as part of the aesthetic um, um, restoration of the project. It is part of the beautification. And when done right, I think they're just quite a gorgeous. And I do believe plants and people um, really coalesce together well. And in fact, I would argue that people would rather be near plants than by rocks alone. These are just sitting little islands if you wanted to sit there and be surrounded by uh, plant materials. But this is in rooting soil. You wouldn't know it. So I think there's a huge growth potential in selling more rooting soil. And there's two companies that will buy compost. You know, one is Playsteads and the other one is Minnesota Topsoil. And they're buying compost and blending it with different ratios as Duane has in his specifications of sand and topsoil and uh, compost. Um, I do believe this is one of the largest growth potentials that's so badly underutilized, I can't, I can't even fathom what's going on. And in my opinion, based on what one of the home builders did in Wisconsin, that nobody in Minnesota can put sod down without first having two inches of, of compost. Yes, you'd probably have to get a legislative decree because nobody's going to do nothing if it costs money. But this is one of the things that I think we should be doing more because this is the future for water budgeting. Um, Believe it or not, there are home builders now that sell a house that'll tell you how much water sod's gonna need over a year. That's to me is the future for climate resiliency or climate change or whatever you believe. It doesn't matter anymore because climate change is real in my world. I can't keep things from falling apart with the weather we've been having. But the idea that this is not only carbon banking, but this is basically minimizing the amount of water it takes to support um, gorgeous turf. And so I think we're not using uh, these spaces and adding enough compost. Um, this is just, like I say, I think this is a huge uh, growth industry. We just got to do a lot more convincing of people that this is not only the right thing to do, but the benefits to the next generation are uh, you know, immeasurable. Carbon sequestration and using less water to, to basically what I call a drug dependent rug or sod uh, to persist in a gorgeous condition. And you know, we had a lot of salt. Most compost doesn't help on salt, but it still helps on water budgeting. Um, and then there's still gonna be a lot more of these living walls. And this is a compost wall. Um, this is compost on top of a turf reinforcement. I'll come back to this. You know, there's a compost embedded into this topsoil and some of these very steep and walls. Um, just give you a sense that this is why I need the three quarter inch screen. So when you're putting it onto a turf reinforcement mat, that it actually fits into the voids here. So three quarter inch, would not fit and lost most of it will just tumble right down off the slope. So we need this screen enough. So this is way different than the typical erosion control because I'm filling and this is all crunkled up. It ain't supposed to look like that, but that's, you know, they'll fold it back out. But this is a, a root reinforcement material and we want that growing media to be part of that rooting environment to maximize the chia pet expression on these steep and engineered faces. And this is 100% compost. This is a cellular confinement system. Um, and this is right by the uh, Hazeltine uh, no, it's not Hazel. Well, it's one of the golf courses that uh, Tiger Woods used to go to, um, and it might be quite a while after his accident before he gets back to golfing, but this is in the uh, Chaska area. So it's whatever the golf course is there, and uh, it's an area that they needed instantly green, so steep that we had to put the, the cellular confinement, rebar pins, and this thing was all injected in, and it chia petted great. And this is an example of an engineered wall of the same thing, but in a stacked wall configuration where they're using... Um, this case of the rooting soil, the rooting, and it's got mostly sand, but there's a compost component. And today you'd never know what this, you know, how we built the thing, because it's all vegetated really nice as needed as part of the stream uh, value. And this is point number seven, the boulevard. Where you typically would see that material would be these medians, where they're not designed to be rain gardens, they're just designed to be growing plants. We hope forever with minimum maintenance. And this is where we would use that material. And part of this is we're trying to make sure that um, that if a car came off, that they minimize the compaction in this area while still promoting you know, exceptional rooting potential of the grasses, the trees, and other plants planted in here. And this is an example, my point number eight, 
um, is uh, top sill borrow. We're using a lot more. So this area right down here, this is the sand compost blend. Um, and this is actually PD mucky soil that we salvaged from this project. This is on your way to Ely, uh, Truncawi one. And this, we wouldn't believe it, but these are speed bumps for stormwater and it's going through this filter media and then eventually goes into an, an under drain and out to, into the receiving waters. So this is um, that Chia Pet material and you can see the, the, the color and everything is in this area. So it's just a great way of using and using the green space more effectively for treating all the water that comes off our new impervious surfaces. I just think there's a growing market somewhat in this, but it's mature um, that I'm not sure we're gonna be using a lot more because there's a lot of complaining people that says compost is releasing phosphorus you know, in our stormwater systems. I'm not sure I agree yet, but the data seems to get stronger and stronger that compost is still releasing phosphorus you know, several years after it's installed and it's contributing to some of the uh, greening of our lakes, um, blue-green algae and other algae growing. Um, so I suspect this is maturing and it'll start putting in more peat um, blends with compost and pure compost, but that, you know, we'll see to see what actually happens there. But just another example of the rain, this is University Avenue as part of the Central Corridor light rail, but part of the median here is a sand compost material. Um, so this is University Avenue, there's a McDonald's and the Capitol isn't very far from here. So I know there'll still be a lot of, a lot of these designed. I just think that the market is changing because no one knows what to do about the phosphate release. But the idea that you've got this media, planting media of an engineered soil that's composed of sand and some organic material to ensure plants grow, filter out the uh, typically metals and uh, PAHs. So those are hydrocarbon like materials, gasoline, diesel, um, and then um, some of the nutrients as well. So this is one of my favorite uh, materials. And I think there's a huge growth potential besides adding it where sod goes. But we have a lot of poor soils, particularly in Noka sand plain area. And this is where you take 50% of the soil, whatever you got, and you add 50% compost to it. So this is the cottage grove area, really poor soils, um, highly erosive. And that entire project was built out of 50% compost and 50% soil. I remember the year that I did this, I bought every bit of compost the industry had. Um, there was nothing left. I took it all. Um, I made a lot of unhappy people. Then, of course, oh, my God, MnDOT wants compost, and everyone made it ever since. And of course, I don't use it to this rate anymore. But we should be using a lot more of this material to supplement our weaker soils. I uh, know it you know, give you great carbon credits, sequestration, but it really grew plants. And this soil hasn't failed since. This is a multi-million dollar slope failure on uh, in Cottage Grove and it's not failed since. And that's the power of these cohesive organic materials. And the type 10 um, or uh, the point number 10, the type four, the fertilizer. I do think this is a, a, a market, but very slow in growth. Um, and this is basically using compost and making fertilizers out of it. So MnDOT has a spec called type four, um, which is an organic base. And it could be up to 88% organics. Um, and I'm starting to get some companies like Sustain has made a new product um, that allows, that are pretty, getting pretty clever about taking their waste turkey manure and formulating it to something that we can run it through a hydro seeder. Uh, and we'll call it, you know, some people might call it biotic earth. That's one brand. You might, some, one, some another brand is called Proganics. They have their own brand to it. But I really think there's a, a, a market here just not growing very fast on hydraulically applied soil additives. So it's a fertilizer, but it's something they're adding to, again, add to the surface. This might be all the better I have for topsoil. How do you grow plants in this junk? And this is an example of adding these slow release natural fertilizers, but hydraulic. So we can do a lot of area in a small space um, uh, to get the market to work. And just as an example, um, when we're doing work on streams and other things, they don't want the chemical fertilizers. So we're still doing a lot more restoration um, on our natural streams, lake shores, and people don't want fertilizers that when it rains, the stuff immediately falls into our waters and cause eutrophication or you know, blue-green algae and other things later on when the waters warm up. So this is where you'd see um, more of these organic-based, slow-release uh, type fertilizers used. Um, and this is another point here. I've built an entire wetland out of compost. Um, uh, this is still one of the best wetland restoration projects I've ever done. It took a lot more than I thought it should, but it was really fun. I mean, I underestimated how much compost it would take. Um, but this is in the Stillwater area. 
But uh, anyway, you know, wetlands are made out of organic material. So I built a whole wetland out of grade two compost. Um, and it's still one of the best wetland catches I've ever had. Um, to this date, it was a, you know, almost a perfect wetland restoration. So just compost itself. Um, there's a lot of existing markets, developing markets, and I think we should be doing some work together to create some markets um, in compost, but this is just the raw material. And I think we're only limited by our imagination on this thing. But, so I have these street sweepings. I have these garbage soils. Could this be a way of, of taking these soils that normally go to landfills, whether it's river dredge material? Um, and my answer is, I'm doing research on it. My answer is yes, we should be uh, using compost itself and, and using it in a novel ways and, and make soils that normally are what call, I mean, there's nothing really wrong with them, just that they're not soil. They're street sippings, they're sand. They might have some oils in them from leaks. Um, they certainly have leaves and other things that we would pick up from track out and all the other things. But what should we do with this as a society? Now, maybe you don't believe us, but we're running out of landfill space. So it seems to me it makes no sense to throw away soils um, that we could probably get them make them alive again if we could just add compost. So literally these are street sweep piles from the 35W Burnsville Bridge Project. They're just street sweepings. And I would suggest that if I could add compost, I don't know what ratio yet, but maybe 50, 50, some value and create these soils that would be good enough to put back on the roadsides to grow good enough plant material. I'm not growing tomatoes in them. I'm not playing, you're putting a park on them. I'm growing a roadside edge. Um, all the way up to doing some really neat things um, with compost. And again, I've just shared a few of these pictures already, but the idea of just common compost for making green space green or areas that are supposed to be green space. And, and I, I think there's still a lot of resistance to using compost in any novel way, but it's up to the market to help say, well, we feel as taxpayers, this is not a waste of time and money. Another market that I have no idea on, I've got the specification, is the compost tea market. And this is really intended for, let's say, rest areas and other areas, even a whole capital complex, if you think about it. So if you went to your legislature and said, you know, I think that the, that the fertilizer program around the capital um, in St. Paul should not be using any synthetic fertilizers. It should all be compost. Well, the, the Harvard University uses compost tea. And yes, they still fertilize. But instead of fertilizing four times a year for the Harvard campus, they add compost tea three of the four times and they're getting better results, better turf, uh, less weeds uh, by using compost tea. So while I have a provision for it, I can't honestly say I've ever seen it on a project. I do think there's a potential market here, but unless someone steps up and say, you know, we can take compost, spin it out and make tea. Now we know how to do it. It's been done. Um, and then another one that I think is a, an emerging market that people don't understand is it's been approved by the EPA is just compost blanket. You know, two inches, it may not seem like a lot, it's 270 yards, your cubic yards, um, approximately, I guess, you know, maybe uh, almost uh, 300,000 uh, 300, pounds of product per acre. But this was a project where two inches of compost was applied everywhere. This is part of the 610 bypass. This is in Maple Grove area, very sandy soils. And it was amazing how fast we could chip that. So this is just broadcast over the surface. Um, it was seeded and it was mulched because compost will still erode and I needed it to ensure that I didn't erode, but it's just compost everywhere and it's called compost blanket. Um, it is an erosion prevention BMP when applied at two inches. Um, and I think this is a tremendous market opportunity that is again, under specified. Um, and this is what and I mean I by- can, uh, Jump yep. in with a question here. Nick yep. Vetch has a question for you about the compost tea. His question is, is the compost tea lower cost than chemical fertilizer? Well, um, it depends. So if I wanted one gallon, it would be way more money than fertilizer. Now, I don't allow and recommend the use of any chloride-based fertilizers and nothing on planet earth is cheaper than chloride-based fertilizers. So while it might be um, more expensive than the conventional salt-based fertilizers, it's not very good for our soils and it's certainly not good for our environment if it washes away. So what happens to the chlorides? Um, you might be getting potassium along for the ride, but where does the chloride go? Um, so we haven't really paid the true price of using you know, some fertilizers in certain areas based on what it does to soil health and soil life. So they've reduced their fertilizer um, in Harvard, for example, by a lot, but that's because they have the compost produced on site. So they're making their own. So the cost savings is because it's internalized. 
and they're not taking their money and spending it out in the marketplace. Now, the cost to install fertilizer or compost tea doesn't change. It's, it's the source. But I still think the market is underutilizing, you know, basically fresh brewed tea uh, for, for plant health. We don't have a lot of research on it, although if you went into the uh, Mother Earth News and those magazines, I mean, this is just a big, big deal. But it certainly should be a much bigger deal for urban areas where you're worried about cats and dogs and maybe baby feet and people eating the, you know, on the turf. I'd rather that they played in the compost tea again, several days after applied, don't get me wrong, than it would be to be on, on salt-based fertilizers on the same lawn. But it takes a leader. You know, someone's got to step forward and say, you know, I think we should be using more of this um, kind of material brewing tea for um, using less salt. And here's the fun part um, you know, for the group, Nick included. What happens when there is no more phosphorus to be mined? What happens when the uh, potassium mines go empty? Now, what are we going to do? And how many think we're not far removed from having no phosphate mines and potassium mines? You look it up once, I think you're going to be surprised that the N, P, and K that we use to really push agricultural crops are probably coming to an end at an economical value. So I suspect that as they become shorter in supply, that the compost tea will be the cat's meow to do more with less. And that's where I really see this. Um, particularly in these areas where you have a lot of other people using that same green space. Does that answer the question? If not, you can that, come back to it. That was great. It. Thanks, Dwayne. And then the other one that's a lot, what I consider a large growing market is um, uh, what's called organic fiber matrix. And there's a lot of potential here as I see it. It's, it's not compost tea, but it could actually be part of the component. But that is, I put these turf reinforcement mats down and then we inject hydraulically, as I'm showing you here, um, just putting this material down. This is a product, these are commercial products, but they might have sea kelp in them. They might have bovine you know, extract juices and you know, a whole bunch of other neat things in it. But there's no reason that compost uh, you know, from, from Minnesota couldn't be used. Now, I'm pretty sure we don't have sea kelp in Minnesota, but nonetheless, this is the kind of material that we need to vegetate. Um, this is, a, this is a, a large slope above a critical lake um, near um, Detroit Lakes in Minnesota, just done. It's part of the Heartland Trail, beautiful project, uh, beautiful experience if you're in that area of Minnesota to bike it uh, and walk it. But we're having to hold up the steep slope and this was all injected then with a product similar, if not the same one as this thing. And this is what I'm injecting on a slope that failed to grow plants. So this is what it looked like. Um, it was just done this fall and come back again. And I think you're gonna be surprised that just putting these organic materials through a hydro seeder um, because I can do a large area. I don't want to put equipment on here. So this is, a, I think, a huge growth potential, um, but we've got to be able to get this market to mature to get people to start using and specifying more of this. So I do expect continued growth here of these agents and Sustain um, is one of the suppliers that's made a new product for me that Minnesota DOT is looking at. And I hope to get it on our approved products list as an alternative to my organic, as an acceptable, I don't mean an alternative, just an acceptable um, product that meets the specification of organic fiber matrix. So it's hydraulically applied that has erosion prevention and designed to grow plants. I think it's way cool. And that would be power injected into these three dimensional grids. And then another opportunity um, where I am using a lot of compost is vegetated riprap. Here's a cartoon that I use for training. And what it is, um, is just taking compost and injecting and filling up all the voids of riprap. Um, I think this is a potential it may not be a large growth industry, but as it's, it should be a continuing one. So I've got more and more projects where they're, it's called vegetated riprap, by the way. I used to call it compost grouting, uh, but the engineers don't like the word grout and the word compost in the same sentence. So now it's called vegetated riprap. So we put place the riprap and shoot compost into the voids and you know, stand back and shoot pet the sucker right out. Um, this is an area on, on one of my projects in, uh, on the St. Croix. And this is just an example how it'd be showing up. So it says grout with compost. So this is taking the riprap that's here and hiding it aesthetically. So you don't see it. If you were to go on, this is in St. Cloud. If you were to go there today, I'm um, going um, eastbound on 23, right out of the St. Cloud and right below you is the Mississippi River. I think you'll be surprised at how chia petted this is. I basically built a soil media here out of compost and let the trees that were on both sides fall and seeds fall on here. And today you'd never know that we even had disturbance you know, that, not that many years ago, because it just grew like nobody's business to recolonize 
the forested area along the Mississippi River in St. Cloud. And that's just the power of vegetated riprap. So it's structurally super solid, but vegetatively soft and way cool um, to be. <clears throat> just an example in a, in a stormwater pond also, had, but it's just a slope where we're injecting that into that face. And then there's a lot of compost that we're- One more question. Oh, absolutely. Um, this question from Larry, he says, does MnDOT identify compost in the bid packages? Yes, um, this will actually, this will be grade two. So we've got a quantity shown. So this is an example, and this real plan has already been built. Um, we'll actually tell the contractor, we estimate the quantity and it's based on the rock void space. It's about 25% of the rock. So if you've got one cubic yard of rock, you'll have a quarter cubic yard of compost to go with it. And that's the same thing here. This is a rock, part of a drain tile system for stormwater. Um, and this compost was pre-blended with the rock. So you could have uh, rock placed first, power injected as I showed you here. Um, it can be pre-blended. And then the last step is that we now will put the compost down and power wash it into the voids and keep adding it. So that my spec has three ways to add compost to rock. Pre-blended, uh, power blasted, pneumatically blasted in or power washed in. This again is just an example of a pre-blended compost rock material. And this is again designed to have a certain volume of water for volume reduction and to grow trees. The trees love growing in rocks, by the way. These would just like to have something in there besides just air and water. And this compost um, really provides it. If you put soil in here, it just packs down and you have no void space for water. Compost doesn't take that away. So here's an example of, of a real recipe. This is from Stockholm. Um, and it's called Stockholm soil. And this literally is growing trees on rock, but it's compost with the rock. And here's an example where the compost was placed and power washed in. This is on, on your way to, um, um, I believe, uh, Morton, Minnesota on, uh, gosh, I can't think of the name of the road right now. But anyway, the compost is placed here on the riprap for beach stabilization. And aesthetically, they didn't wanna see this for wave action. So we put the compost in, it was power washed in. Um, and today it's still rip wrapped, it's still armored for the wave action, but it's growing plants like you wouldn't believe. So just, just an example of, uh, of using compost in a weird way uh, to grow plants in a way that most people would have no idea what we just did, but it's functioning as intended. And then just as an example, what it looked like. So here's that rock area. Um, and then there's more landscape beds. So this is actually tilled in. And this whole area was actually compost to create a, a a water treatment system from the new road that comes over the system. It's Truck County 60, by the way, that's what I remember now. Um, and this is just an example, but this is compost placed and power washed in. And uh, you'll, you should start seeing more and more recipes of the Stockholm soil and the use of rocks and rock voids to make rooting areas. Another novel area um, would be my point number 17 um, is the idea of structural soil. So this is by the, uh, uh, the COPE area, it's a Boy Scout uh, camp on the uh, Fort Snelling area, you know, the airport area. And this actually is intended for overflow parking once in a while. So it's this, it looks like extruded aluminum instead of made out of plastic. And this is an ex excellent place where compost would be used to grow what looks like a turf grass, which is what it is to be mowed in a conventional manner and still be used for overflow parking on those times of the year when it's necessary. So you get great water quality, super structural soils to hold semi trucks and fire trucks and uh, water, whatever you need, um, and not sink in and still have it looking like a grease space for mowing. This is a perfect example of combining structural. This is by special provision. I don't see a huge growth market here, but it is real. And uh, my 18 is weed control. We don't do much about this. I think we should do more um, as a growth industry. And this is work done by Dr. Glanville. I know we've had him present before at the council. Um, I'm using a bit more of it for the punch down for utility operators. This, this is an example that I show you in the picture here. But you, know, you put, let's say, five inches, I mean, up to four inches, two inches to four inches, you'd be surprised what it'll do for suppressing the weeds in the seed bank and still growing the things that we put on top. And I don't think we're actually utilizing compost as a weed control material under disturbed land conditions where all you did is daylight this, the weed seed bank. And I'm using a lot of compost. There's two areas in this for us as a punch down list for top dressing on sod that didn't come in. That's what I'm showing you at the bottom here. And this just represents soils that just didn't come in. They micro erosion and it looks like a zebra stripe. But this is what I mean by punch down, of putting the material down in small areas to fill the rills rather than starting over. And this is one of the craziest things I've ever done. It didn't work the way I wanted to, but that's the wall I have to vegetate. 
They were supposed to put soil behind here and they forgot. I mean, who knew? And so we're literally putting compost and with the, I used a high performance tackifier and sticking it on this wall. And it actually held better than I thought. We actually put a blanket over it too, but it's, isn't that weird? Well, I don't know. Um, it did something, um, but it still you know, needed a lot more water. And I'm doing compost and such strange things that I'm actually injecting it into walls that failed. Again, just power punching it into the voids of these mechanically stabilized earth walls. And this one did chia pit. The contractor did take it seriously to add water. And today you've got the, um, the native plants. This is part of the trail. So the loop trail is part of the St. Croix River Bridge Project. Again, I encourage you to get on that trail, do that seven mile pathway, downtown Stillwater to the old bridge, climb up the hill um, and get across the neat bridge and take a look at this great wall. You can't miss it once you see what see it. But this is how I fixed that wall that just would not grow because the soil kind of fell out of these geogrid areas and we just power punched it right back in with seed and uh, add a little bit of water and by golly if it didn't turn out quite well. So to me the future is doing a lot more of, of enhancing these weak areas. This is just sod that died and I think we should be doing more of this believe it or not um, for you know, after the winter. You know salt damaged turf areas. The plows capture areas. It's not it's, you can't help it. Um, but it'd be nice to actually get these areas to chia pit for water quality. And I really think that we should be you know, working with cities to have a program that would add compost to these winter damaged areas to no fault of anyone. They just happen. So the last piece that I want to give you is that I tried to look at the different prices that we are that we've currently paid. So if you look at, uh, you know, just using a filter berm, I actually did get it in 2020. Um, what I'm actually paying per, um, in this case, a lineal foot for the berm. This is what I'm paying for the sediment control logs type compost, uh, filter top soil, boulevard soil, grade one compost, which is more of the manure based. Um, what I'm paying per cubic yard for compost, just whether it's in trees, um, what I'm currently paying for type four fertilizers. And then that root wrap is the soil filled, you know, compost filled rip wrap, just give you a sense of, of how much, but the volume wasn't that large, but this is the kind of things that, you're, that I'm using it for. So I just wanted to give you a sense of that piece. And um, so from my point of view, the compost utilization growth areas are organic topsoil materials, rooting topsoil materials, engineered soils. And part of that is after the winter and then more sediment control logs, I believe is what you will likely see as a, as a potential growth in the, in the industry. That's what I have. Um, I hope that you got something out of it. That's great. Uh, absolutely mind blowing, uh, as usual, Dwayne. Um, I, I don't know who can think that there are not enough uses for compost after all of that. <laughs> so, some pretty That's cool projects. That's why the marketplace has really got to step up, in my opinion, and say, you know, what? Go to the city of Maple Maple Grove, for example. You know, all that dead sod that from salt, from plow operations. Why are we doing nothing? You know, how little would it actually take? And I remember, Chuck, we used a manure spreader on one of the projects, it literally was just a manure spreader and we stood on a, on a carbon gutter and flung it over. And then you just go on the trail, the pathway I showed you, then we just swept it off. It didn't even take much. And that's yeah. just basically to enhance these poverty soils. Absolutely, and I know some cities are actually doing that. I know some, uh, the city of Burnsville actually is doing quite a bit with uh, salt damage during the winter time. Um, so it's, it's so it's some great opportunities that are still out there. Much, much more needs to be done. I really like the idea of the home builders really jumping on board with the, um, you know, incorporating those soils back into as a landscape designer in the past. I really remember the hardest thing was to go to a homeowner after they just spent $300,000 on this brand new house and were sitting at their card table that's, you know, a little four by four card table. Uh, where they eat their dinner every day and say, okay, but now you have to fix all the soil before you get to plant anything around your house because yeah. that's the way you have to, well, we can't do that. That's way too much money. No way. So I but think there's that's a builder in, in, uh, on, uh, in Dane County, Wisconsin, that's the Madison area that actually has sold houses no matter how bad the economy. Now it's really pretty good for home selling. Um, but, but when we had this big thing that the economy tanked, I don't call it 2007, um, he never lost a home sale because he's selling a house where the water heater says, this is how much energy it uses. Here's how much the stove's gonna use. And he actually had a sticker and said, here's how much the yard's gonna use on water. Now, yeah. isn't that amazing that we mm -hmm. should be talking about water budgets and cities should say, you can't have water on sod unless it has two inches or more of compost before the sod's put down. And that's just to reduce water use. 
-hmm. And I suspect at some point we're going to run out of water in Minneapolis, St. Paul, and even parts of Minnesota. Land of, of 10,000 lakes running out of water. Yeah. It makes no sense to be pumping it on sod. And yeah, the, city just, uh, of, the city of Egan actually uh, has put together some uh, covenants that are actually re they're required to do exactly what you're talking about doing because they're seeing a lot of that stuff starting to happen within the city itself and their aquifers and, and things like that. So it's great. Ginny, you had some? Uh, yeah, I just wanted to uh, comment that I, I, I apologize to those of you who had so much trouble getting in. We tried very hard to give a member benefit um, and turns out we complicated things more than we knew <laughs> and and only the folks who had registered as a paying uh, participant could get in because the link locked anybody else out but we did straighten that out um, it's a always a learning process and we just learned one more thing this time and we appreciate your patience and um, I hope you're this is recorded so we will have it up on the website and you can get, catch the first few minutes of Dwayne's uh, presentation. I know you won't want to miss it. So um, it will be there for you to, to catch up on. So go ahead, Chuck. Sounds great. I think uh, Michaela, do you wanna go through the questions quick here and uh, any of the questions that are, are, are left over for Dwayne? Yeah, yeah, we have a couple questions here. Um, one goes back to the Silver Creek Cliff um, compost pond. It's from Nick. His question is, did that compost pond get hydro mulch on top or was the compost the final cover? Um, in that case, compost was the final cover. The seed was added so that the company put down an inch and a half of compost with the fertilizer and the top half inch had the seed injected and that was it. Perfect. Um, okay. But I'm in the in the North Shore area and we're blessed that uh, that uh, it's really cool there. We have moisture. There are times that I put hydro mulch on top and that's actually to cool the compost in the summer because black sozo can get hot enough to fry my little baby seedlings. So to be clear on what I do, I put a VTC on top of my compost. That means a vegetated thermal cooler. And you new mere mortals know that as hydromulch. <laughs> so I want a VTC on my TRM or my VTC on my compost. Because you know, it's really got to be falutin if it's an acronym, right? Because all engineers want acronyms for everything. You can't call it, you know, hydromulch when you can call it a VTC. Oh, that must be important. We're all going to step away with this information now. So thank you, Dwayne. <laughs> all right, we have another question here. Um, Dwayne, would you mind um, if we provide the audience with your contact information? No, that's fine. Okay, perfect. And I'll I, would, that and I did send... Um, yeah, Chuck and Ginny, I think, um, you know, that one slide that talks about all the MnDOT specs, um, what I've been paying, and I'd recommend getting that to your members. If you're interested, yeah, I'll just throw it away if it's just another junky thing in your mailbox, but yeah. it's yeah. really trying to, it's a synopsis of all the ways that we currently have, and, I, and uh, you know, maybe five or six of them are special provision. You know, I don't have them as standards per se, but they're being used. Yeah, and we are pulling together uh, the bi-monthly e-newsletter that we put out, and it is supposed to go out on Friday. So I think the last day of the month is usually when I, I get it out there. Um, and we can include that so that folks can um, get that in their in well, their. I don't have to, email. but that's what this is, is trying to show, <laughs> you know, the, what, you know what, what we have currently. And where, if you see there's a void here, well, don't be afraid to go through the Minnesota Composting Council and say, I think I've got a spec, you know, could we get that included into a standard construction thing? So call it a private partner, private public partnering thing, but uh, we're only limited by our imaginations. And I know we've got to stop landfilling crap. We need to start making it into uh, a, a, a yeah, usable yeah. product rather than throwing it away. There's just, we just can't afford it. Yeah. Well, okay. who's going to pay for that? Well, who's paying for it now? <laughs> and you pay one way or the other. We uh, all pay me now or pay me later, but someone's going to pay. As long as it's not me, though, I don't care what it costs. <laughs> well, that's just all silly right. Thought. Well, I think we have we have another speaker. Yeah, yeah. I'm anxious to hear him. If so, I, there's one question here, I just want to address here before I move on. Um, Renee asked, I came in, or she said, um, can Dwayne speak to the use of class two food waste versus yard waste compost in certain applications? And that's the final question here. Oh, I wish you wouldn't ask that question. Um, MnDOT spec has lumped them together. We don't differentiate them in, in MnDOT spec. 
Um, Hennepin County has asked me to give a similar presentation that I just gave you and ask uh, how can we specify SSOM only? The city of Minneapolis would like to say that if we're generating the waste, we wanna ensure that it's all used up. But from MnDOT's perspective, there's no functional difference between you know, carrot compost or leaf and grass clipping compost and screen three quarters of you know, kind of a cruder looking compost. It works. It doesn't really matter whether it's carrots and lettuce or leaves, it's still plant-based material. So I can't say that there's one or the other better than the other, because I'm, I'm not sure there is. When you look at the seal of testing assurance test results, I can't tell the difference. And the results don't seem to be more phosphorus. They all seem to be relatively you know, benign looking compost stuff. Mm -hmm. Perfect. Thank you. And, and people do complain about garbage in it. Well, you know, good luck. Don't ever walk on a MnDOT right away then because you'll see nothing but you know, 10 trillion cigarette butts and wrappers of all pro manufacturers on planet Earth. Mm -hmm. that's true. Yeah. I think that's a big key. And I think it's gotten a lot better over the years, too. So I think uh, we've gotten more and more contamination out of the composts that have been out there that are. are specifically derived from food waste and yard waste blends. So it's, it's definitely, it's definitely moving in the right direction. So, but I can say that if you are, if you really want to use SSOM, oh, well then specify it. You, you got to let the contractor know. So you can say MnDOT grade two, but SSOM only. So you can take a MnDOT spec and pick one or the other. You've just now, it's a special revision, I guess, but you can specify that I want it. I don't care where it comes from. I want it to come from leaf and grass clippings only, or I want it to come from SSOM um, only. You can say that. I mean, you're the, you're the owner. You're the ones paying for it. So say so. Just that I don't know that there's a big difference um, you know, between those mm -hmm. kinds of feedstocks at this time. So it's, so the, the short thing is, it, it in terms of its functionality with the plants, it's pretty much the same. But it in terms of making sure that we are supporting the programs that are collecting organic materials within this metro area and or the state, we the user or the, the buyer, the purchaser would like should should specify that if that's that's a priority for them. That's pretty basically what you're saying. There. Yes. Because you look at the seal of testing assurance test results between the two products that you know for sure are the right feed classes. When you look at the finished product, you can't differentiate. If I were to switch it, you couldn't tell me which one is which. Mm -hmm. I don't see any significant, I don't see any difference actually when it's installed in the field for turf grow. Um, but so the source that you specify is only because you want to ensure that certain sources are consumed. Mm -hmm. All right. Well, that's your business. The MnDOT is not going to differentiate yeah. and say one or the other when we can't prove that there's a difference between okay. them at this okay. time. Yeah. That there's a benefit to one over the other. For yeah, I don't see it. Yeah. Okay, great. Perfect. All right, Dwayne, hopefully you can stick around here until the end of Chad's too and answer a few more questions. All right, so next for our next speaker, we have uh, Chad Brand from Margolis Companies mm -hmm. here locally in the Twin Cities metro area. Uh, they're out of Roseville, Minnesota. Uh, Chad is a licensed landscape architect spe specializing in all aspects of landscape design, estimating, and construction management with over 15 years of combined experience, both in the design phase and construction phases with projects of all sizes. He understands not only the importance of details, but recognizes and manages the big picture at the same time. Chad is a very detail-oriented design professional who has a passion for native ecosystems and native planting design, understands construction terminology, techniques, and fully understands an integrated design process. Uh, Chad is also a graduate of the University of Minnesota Twin Cities with his Master's of Landscape Architectural degree. So Chad is going to go ahead here and I'm going to actually share the screen here and Chad is going to be the one speaking. Um, so I will get going on that right now. Welcome, Chad. Thanks. Thank you. Uh, like Chuck said, um, got out of Minnesota, University of Minnesota, worked in uh, Worked in construction, uh, was going to school and stuff like that, and then my grounds crew, and then uh, worked in a design firm for a while. Then I uh, worked in an engineering firm for a while, got to see that side of things, and uh, now I'm back in the, in the construction world. I uh, still do design once in a while, but um, living a life as a contractor. Um, so I have to put my designer hat on sometimes and uh, also wear the uh, contractor hat sometimes. So uh, can I kick this off? Um, All right. 
Everybody seeing the screen okay? Yeah, it looks great. So the, the kind of place to start is, well, what do you really want to do for a project? Um, start at the beginning. What do you have? What do you have to work with? Um, what, what can you really do in terms of materials? Um, materials cost money. So if you've got a truck in a lot of material from offsite, you know, been you, you're going to bring in thousands of yards of soil. You know, it's a lot of money in trucking. So if you can do something where you're amending soils on site, you can save significant amount of money for a project. Um, so you need to think about that on the design side and then having the proper specifications. As a contractor, I get to see everybody's specifications. I've got a giant library sitting on my computer of everybody's specs. Um, good, bad, ugly, I've seen everything. Um, and there are sometimes I don't think people really understand what they are specifying. They take it from this last project or they take it from, oh, I saw this over here, I saw this over there. We're just gonna slap it on this project. It worked there, it, why, why shouldn't it work here? Uh, so we see that a lot. And then on the project installation side, the biggest, one of the biggest things I see is just not understanding of installation and all of the nuts and bolts and what it takes to get these projects done in the end. Uh, and then what your, what are your expectations? You know, as a finished product, you know, are you expecting this to look like Augusta National? Uh, if you are, you probably are thinking the wrong thing but understanding that, that sort of thing. Um, and what, what are your goals? Are you thinking stormwater? Are you thinking pollution, wildlife? Um, it, all it all depends on what you wanna do and what the, what the owners, you know, we do a lot of private, a lot of public work. So it all really depends on, comes down to what, do they own, what does the owner wanna do? You know, what do you wanna do as a professional? Um, Cause you know, some people, want or out to you know save the earth and do all these wonderful things um so if that's your your goal in life that's great uh you know if you're really nuts and bolts and i want to fix this stormwater thing or that stormwater thing um you know that's what you go after so you got to really understand what are you really going after and what what do you want in the end um so then you know we'll get a look at you know what is what is the function of soil and we do an infiltration basis. And I've seen lots of different mixes for this, you know, whether it's high in sand, a little bit of organics of some sort, whether it be peat or compost, or something with lots of topsoil component. You know, there are all kinds of different recipes for this stuff. Um, terrace seeding. This is one that, you know, we're seeing in a limited number of cities. I think Dwayne showed lots of pictures of it um, in lots of different places. City of New Hope, City of St. Anthony, uh, Hastings, St. Paul Park. Um, and some of these cities are, have adopted this technology as an alternative for sod and things like that. Um, and we're doing a lot of green roofs. Um, as the urban condition gets built up, you know, people are looking for green space. So they're looking for green space in non-traditional places on top of buildings, on top of parking ramps, uh, things of that nature. So using compost as a component of that soil, along with lightweight organics or other, other sorts of things to make a media in a very artificial environment to grow plants and grow plants successfully. Um, so the next area to really dive into is material availability. You know, we're just this week, we're bidding a project. We're bidding a project down in Rochester, and the specification for the project is Playsteads and Elk River. So when you think about trying to truck thousands of yards of soil from Elk River to Rochester, there's a lot of cost involved in that. So, is there something we can do with reusing existing soil on site, adding a little bit of compost of whatever type? and making something that works on site. You know, using, you know, varying recipes that, that work and understanding you know, everything you do has a cost implication. And, you know, as a component of that, 
all of the trucking has a very significant environmental impact. So, you know, just making sure you understand that sort of thing. You know, what goes, what goes into design? You know, there's a lot, a lot of pieces that go into design. You know, we trying to, you know, look at things with, you know, making sure you have a, a good, good solid design, looking at spaces, things like that. Um, engineering, sound environmental practices, stormwater, irrigation, water infiltration, um, things of those natures. You know, so making sure that it's going to be sustainable now um, and into the future. And you, you know, picking apart that compost can play you know an integral role if you understand its role and how to incorporate it correctly in your design. Taking 12 inches of compost and filling all your plant beds is not the solution. Making that a component and making it the right component in your design is important. Now, so we get to design your project. Now, looking at soil conditions, what are your pre-existing construction conditions? During construction, we have seen the good, bad, ugly. Dwayne showed some pictures of stuff. You know, the abuse that contractors show a site for landscape is absolutely horrific. Um, people driving lulls or whatever everywhere, wet soils, compacting the living daylights out of it. Um, so really you need to change the mindset on those sorts of things. And then post, you know, post construction, what are you really after? Are we, what are we supposed to grow here? Are we growing a native prairie area that it, it doesn't need to be perfect. We're not building this athletic field and we're not building a golf green. So understanding what is the finished product that we're designing to. Now, site, con site concerns, drainage, traffic, environment. We see things like this that, what are you trying to do? You're trying to grow little tiny patches of sod in a concrete jungle. Why does this make sense? You know, aesthetically, yeah, it's cool. Okay. But really long term, what is it going to take to do that? on understanding your planting. What are you trying to grow? If you're trying to grow a high level perennial garden, it takes a different type of soil than something that's got a lot of native vegetation in it. So understanding those aspects of it and what the maintenance um, inputs you're gonna have long-term. And so you look at a couple sites, you know, they're very high functioning, um, you know, sites that have you know, lots of shrubs, lots of perennials, lots of turf. Um, things are changing. I mean, we're seeing lots of projects that have higher levels of perennial gardens and native perennial gardens, so more of these manicured um, native meadows. So that's a different look and it's a different take on what you have to do to make that system work. From, the soils all the way up through the plants themselves, irrigation, the maintenance. It's a different system. So you need to understand the system that you're operating in. Um, so then the importance of, of uh, proper specs. When you're bidding the project, you get stuff that's conflicting, you know, clear descriptions of stuff, you know, and, and enforcement of specs. So you, you will see things where we want this testing, we want that testing, we want these samples, we want those samples, and we want testing for every 500 yards, or, you know, we want this specific test. And do you realize or do you understand what you are asking for? Um, it's difficult for people to, you know, they're not experts in this stuff all the time. So people that live and breathe this every single day, they know this stuff inside and out. So understanding what you're asking for for a finished material, what the real relevant testing is for what you're trying to do. Um, installation means and methods, things like that. Additives, approvals, and understanding the time and you know, soil testing and all this stuff, it takes time. So building that time into the project schedule is difficult. And compensation. So if I'm going to bid a project and it's going to say, Here's, you know, we want you to do this soil and you can add this, these 12 ingredients for soil maintenance. I don't know what I'm going to get when I bid a, bid a project. So I don't know how much compost do I need to add? How much sand do I need to add? Do I need to add peat? Do I need to add something else to modify pH or whatever else? 
So there's no real true way for me to bid that project and for it to be fair on the contractor side. And one thing that I remember a long time ago on a presentation that Dwayne said, if you want the contractor to do it, make it a bid item. Make all of these individual amendments for your soil systems, make them their own pay item. Then if you need it for a project, you've got a basis to pay for that. I saw, and I can't find the spec. I wish me and Chuck would look through this, look for this for a while. We can't find it. But I remember coming across a project we bid in the last year or so that they actually had a provision that said the bid is based around having these amendments at these ratios and anything above that will be paid for you know at these pay items so it may be very fair and very apples to apples on the contracting side and that's the only time in all the years i've been doing this that i've seen that it was and it stuck out it was pretty cool um so on the next slide the you know setting your standards understanding what are you after you know organic compact content like 10 percent in planting beds five percent turf areas less than five percent native seating areas and these ratios these percentages you know they're a little bit of a moving target uh, it all depends on kind of really what you want to do i uh, got to do a little bit of research to figure out what is the right because too much organic compound organic content is bad you know you'll get too much too much is a you know can be a bad can be a bad thing so uh, you need to need to take that into consideration too um the next one you know the best thing to do is don't disturb areas if you can avoid it. Uh, as much as I love to restore everything and get paid for it, um, the best thing in the end is try not to disturb as much. Also protect it as much as you can. Um, amend, you know, existing areas with compost, stockpiling. You know, dealing with all the stuff that stockpiling soils on site. You know, you see the earthwork contractor just push it up in a pile, and then they just spread it back out. And everything that they pulled out when they stockpiled it is still in it. Doesn't get screened. Doesn't get sifted through so you get all of those issues you know, and incorporate um, you know amended stuff and blend soils you know you won't be able to use existing topsoil on every site some sites you will have to bring in stuff but maximizing your dollar um, when you can using the existing stuff is important And then the next slide is um, Chuck stuck this on there. He can probably speak to this a little bit better than I can, um, but it's compost calculator. So depending on what you're trying to do um, with depth and organic matter and things like that, and knowing what is the compost that you're going to use, what the, what that compost has for as far as organic matter and things like that, it'll tell you how much you need to apply. Um, so it's not just a, well, you need to put four inches or three inches or two inches or one inches. It really depends on what you're working for from a parent standpoint for a parent soil and for uh, the compost you're using, because not all compost is created equal. Um, the next slide, you know. And I could, I could kind of step in here, Chad, too, if yeah. you like. Um, I think it's, what's really great about this is, I, I like how you're talking about how setting your options to kind of meeting those standards and this is a great tool um, that uh, Washington State. So these tools are actually out there in the in the real world, and and this one actually the city of Egan utilizes quite frequently. And and what's great about it is you can kind of take your original you know things that you've got as far as on the site, as far as your conditions go, your soils. You can take and do the testing on that and say, okay, here's my bulk density. It's got a one percent organic matter content right now. I'm shooting for 10 or I'm shooting for five. Um, I can take the true dry weight bulk density of compost and, and the amount of organic matter that's in that compost, um, plug those numbers in because that should be what you're asking for in a test and, and how deep I'm gonna incorporate it into the soil, eight inches, six inches, or a couple of inches. And it'll calculate out the application rate to get you to that 10%. So if you're, you're gonna to need to put three inches on top of this soil, incorporate it eight inches deep to get to 10% organic content. And this is, this is just a ballpark. This isn't gonna hit it every time, but this is gonna get you really close. Um, now you can take and figure out the area that you're looking at to cover. 
and it'll kick out how many yards, what the price is for the compost and, and what the overall cost of that is. So this is really a great tool to kind of kind of going back to what Dwayne was talking about with like fixing the soils on a residential home site or, or let's say a commercial construction project like a, a, a brand new McDonald's that just went in and you want to fix the soils around there and you know that they're poor to begin with, you can kind of figure out and get a close ballpark. Um, and you can do that at the front of the job too, to kind of have a plan in place to have that bid item available for the contractor like Chad to bid it then in the, in the end. Yep. I hate the word incidental. No, it's an incident. It's in, it's incidental to planting. You see that in, sorry, Dwayne, you see that in MnDOT projects all the time. The compost is incidental to the planting. Why? Why is it incidental? That's, I hate incidental. So that's my, sorry, Dwayne, that's my MnDOT beef. Um, so then you get to the next slide. Um, Chuck's provided, uh, you know, what is the, what does the testing data look like? What should you be, what should you be asking for to see what, what am I getting for? What am I getting on a compost? So there are, you know, very specific testing requirements and results, you know, expected by the composting council. So what, what am I getting? Um, you know, cause I've seen really, really bad compost. You know, and are they, you know, a licensed composting facility? There's a lot of people peddling compost that are not licensed. So, um, making sure that you know what you're buying, uh, that you're truly getting, you know, your best value for your buck. And that you're truly, you know, you're getting what you're, what you're asking for. You know, and there's many different specifications. Uh, our national organization for landscape architects, ASLA has, you know, a generic kind of one that they use. Um, MnDOT's got their, their ones that everybody has seen. Um, different cities have their, their own things, Filtrex. Um, then one of the kind of newest things that's out there, um, everybody's probably heard of LEED for green building stuff. Um, SITES is the Sustainable Site Initiative. Um, that was collaboration between the Lady Bird Johnson Center in Texas and the National ASLA to really develop a, a LEED green initiative metric system for landscapes. So the lead for buildings, you know, give you good, good solid stuff for figuring out green buildings. It wasn't a good way to do green landscapes. So that's where sites, sites came in. That's kind of new within the last um, five to 10 years. Um, and they've married the two together. So now it's part of leading the green Bu building council. So you'll see a lot of things with that, with soils, so there's specific sections in there for soils. Um, so look at that and stuff. You know, and you, you can take take a product like um, a MnDOT product, and it's, you can use it as a starting point, and you, then you can modify it as as you as you see fit. Um, the one on the right that uh, is highlighted there uh, was a rain garden project that we saw. And understanding when you're writing specifications, understanding what you are writing. Uh, in this case, they specified the mix of compost and sand, not by volume, but by weight. The problem with that was compost is light, sand is heavy. So if you're trying to do a 50-50 by weight, now you have to add a significant amount of compost to your sand components. Now you've got a three to one compost to sand ratio, and that causes problems down the line. So understanding what you're writing, what you're asking for, uh, is important. Um, and you know, a funny picture, but, you know, what are you trying to do? You know, are you trying to build something that is artificial or something that's usable in long term? So you know, understanding what is your long term aspect? Um, project installation. I could talk for hours about this. Um, timelines. What is a realistic time frame? Uh, we deal with other trades every single day on our sites. The electricians, the earthwork guys, the concrete guys, these guys, that guys, the siding people. Um, they're, it's all problematic. Approvals and testing. How long does it take to get stuff back? To get it truly approved and tested. Um, there is a, a group in New York City 
um, I believe it's SiteWorks. They've got, they, they're a, like a landscape architect, uh, kind of like a resident engineer, but they call themselves more like resident landscape architects. They're kind of an owner's representative on projects. They've built into their projects that they help people manage. They've built into the schedule for the projects, soil submittals and what that means for uh, a timeline for the project. Um, so taking a look at that stuff and understanding that this stuff's not always like just go down to your local improvement store and pull it off the shelf. Some of this stuff takes time and you know, you can't just snap your fingers and it shows up. Understanding site conditions. You know, we, we work in very difficult sites. Things are getting smaller. You got people stacked on top of each other. Weather, as many times as I see in a spec, this says do not work you know, when the soil is greater than field capacity. The wonderful thing that keeps coming back is schedule. I mean, you need to keep on schedule. Even if it's the wrong thing to do, you got to keep on schedule. And it's horrible to say that, but it's the reality of what we live and product availability. Okay, I need 10,000 yards of compost tomorrow. Is it really out there? Or did I need to call somebody six months ago, eight months ago and say, hey, we got this project coming up. Make sure you have this stuff available for us. And I think projects these days seem to be living on compressed timelines. The, the time it takes to truly do things properly is not allotted on projects anymore. So how do we deal with that? And how do we better ourselves as a construction industry? I don't have the answer to that. I wish I did. But And then what are your expectations long term? Maintenance, what are you going to do? You know, is this a, is this a high intensity maintenance site like a golf course type of thing or is it a native prairie that there is maintenance but it's going to be at a different level and then what are your warranty expectations you know, one year two years three years um understand what is what are we getting long term and what what is the ultimate goal on stuff it's really you know to get to the end of it you know you really have to ask yourself what are we trying to do and can compost play a a factor in that to help projects meet their budget and um, expectations in terms of design and finished product. So, Chuck, thanks a lot, Chad. So that, that was great. So I think uh, a lot of interesting things to think about there when you're designing a spec. I, I kind of go back to one of the projects that you had there, a couple pictures back of the Vikings uh, training facility. And I was lucky enough to work with Chad on that job. Um, you know, when you start talking about weather, the, the season that we did that project, it was probably the one of the wettest, I think it ended up being the wettest season on record uh, that year. And uh, I know Dwayne Stenley had some pictures of a two inch compost blanket on a slope. Um, Chad, you ended up having to go and put a, a bunch of compost on one of the big slopes up there. And, and one of the great things about compost is it actually really helps hold those slopes in t intact and uh, allows them to uh, really hold the moisture for getting um, plants to get established. Um, so you went and put it all on that slope. And what was great is we had a couple of big, huge rain events right after you got it done in it. And yes, there was some erosion on it, but it, it held up pretty great. The downfall of compost is because it holds so much water. How long did it take for you to get back on that slope to finish it, fine tune it and seed it? I think it, it ended up being almost four weeks because yeah. it sucked in so much of the moisture. Yeah, I think the one other thing that we're seeing on projects too is um, engineers and other people in watershed districts and some other agencies and stuff, not understanding that when you see a layer of compost on a site as a BMP, it's a finished product. It is it is an erosion control method. They see dirt, so they under, they think that well, it's this site's not vegetated, so we need you know we need to do something from an erosion control standpoint. And it's not the case. So it's educating all of the people and players involved. And there's so many different people that aren't educated. And how do you do that in a you know a very good a good way? So you try to try to explain as much as you can uh, and point people in the right directions, but you know, we we see it every day on projects. Yeah, great, thanks. Um, and Michaela, were there a few questions or? 
don't have any yet, but uh, folks, make sure that you are putting your questions in the in the box down there, and we will definitely answer them. Um, what we have Chad here. So Dwayne had to step off, but uh, Chad is, is here to answer. We have about a half hour here, um, the time for questions. Well, and there was a comment in the Q and A uh, regarding would we put the slides up on the website, which um, Dwayne's presentation, of course, is public information. And so we can easily put that up and we'll have to see if Chad is willing to put his up because his is private, it's a company. So there's different rules for different folks, <laughs> uh, but we can put Dwayne's up and we can also will be putting, we can put that up with the uh, recording as well, so. Perfect. So um, Chad, you know, just a couple of things. Um, so on, on a lot of your projects, do you see compost just starting to be that tool that can be utilized for a lot of different soil conditions? Would you rather just use one thing or something to fix some of those soils on site or are you more of a proponent to, to pre-blend everything and get it into sites that way to, to solve your problems? Um, for us, I don't think there's a, there's a one size fits all uh, application for stuff. It's, you kind of have to look at it on a case by case basis. You know, so when you get into an urban site where you don't have a lot to work with, you know, you are gonna need to bring some stuff, blend some stuff off site and bring it. But if you're in a, you know, a suburban environment where you've got, um, you've got some existing soil to work with, you know, you can bring, you know, at the Vikings campus in Eden, you know, we, we tilled three inches of compost into all of the, the seed sod native areas on that site. So, so there's thousands of yards, instead of bringing four to six inches of topsoil in across that entire site, we amended and worked with what was there. So. You know, those, those those are the applications where there's a lot of dollars and cents savings there. So, you know, making, doing what you can to uh, to help project budgets and get a little creative on it. Um, and so if a project calls for four to six inches of soil on a, on a site, maybe you can do something as, as far as a VE type of a situation on, on projects like that. So it's kind of a little, it takes a little bit out of the box thinking sometimes. I, I really liked your slide on kind of the traditional or today's function of soil, because I think that's kind of an important piece that a lot of people miss. I think uh, kind of traditional function of soil was to uh, grow a vigorous plant. Um, that was that was the idea. It was, it was to kind of, you put soil there to help hold some moisture and nutrients there for the plant. Um, and I think today's function of soil has really changed over the course of the years to like kind of what you're going after there, the green roof situations. It's, it's more of a soil management system and a water management system, kind of more focusing on the water and the erosion and, and sediment movement of that. Yeah, and like, we, you know, we did a big, a big project uh, as part of the LRT project on University Avenue. We didn't put the structural soils in, you know, but we planted all the trees in them. You know, so they're using soils as stormwater treatment systems. So instead of building big giant ponds and things like that, now you're, you know, introducing water in the soil, you know, getting it to do different things. Um, so you're, yet, yeah, you know, we're asking soil to do things that traditional pipe and pond is, has done in the past. So understanding that, understanding how they work, how they, and how the engineering and all the, the construction of that works, it's still an evolving market and a lot of, people don't understand how to build those systems properly. So we see a lot of bad, um, bad things that happen still. Absolutely, absolutely. No, and I think it's great too. I mean, there are a lot of specifications that are out there. Um, there's, uh, you know, Filtrex is, has a plethora of, of different designs that incorporate compost. Um, I, I know the sites does. Uh, the Minnesota Stormwater Manual, um, for those that are out there that uh, are looking for other things that they can utilize compost in, um, the Minnesota Stormwater Manual has a lot of tools that do actually incorporate compost into those systems to treat stormwater. Um, uh, and like Dwayne said, MnDOT has some things. I know that was one of the earlier questions. Um, MnDOT has a specification book that can actually be uh, pulled up online and you can download the PDF of the entire specification book and uh, look for compost in there. And he'll have a lot of those different specifications that he was alluding to earlier in his conversation too. And I believe the uh, American Association of Landscape Architects also has 
a, a section of usage, compost usage uh, uh, specifications as well too for different things. Michaela, go ahead. Yeah, Chad, we have a couple questions here. Um, Nick is asking, as suggested by Dwayne, do you place a compost layer beneath sod installation? And do you see that as a potential growth market? Uh, we haven't done that per se yet as, as a specific, just a compost layer. Um, in Egan, that is one of the things that they do underneath all of their turf, uh, whether it be seed sod or otherwise. Um, they've got an application that they want the 5% organic matter. So it's, it's kind of in the documents as they want three inches across the site, but it, it can, they're, what they're truly looking for is a, a, a percentage. Um, so you can vary that thickness a little bit. Um, so any areas that get disturbed, they're going to get seed and sod, cedar sod, will get compost incorporated into. And that's not just put it on the surface, it's tilled and ripped in. So like when we did the Viking site, we ripped it in uh, 12 to 18 inches uh, with the ripper tooth we got on our machines. And then we tilled it in with the, the tillers just to incorporate it fully. Uh, and it's, it's amazing once those slopes receded, how well they held um, and how quickly that stuff got vegetated. It was, it was really amazing to kind of watch that um, process mm -hmm. kind of unfold. So um, whether it's just put in as a layer underneath sod or incorporated, I, as much as you can get, you know, get the, um, get that microorganism, all uh, the little critters in the soil, get that community kickstarted as much as you can and, you know, build that because that makes all of the other processes go. Absolutely. And I can kind of add to that. Um, I know Dwayne's done some studies too and can kind of played with it. Um, I think the big key is like Chad had said there is, is if you can get the microbes there, eventually they'll help populate the subsoils. Um, obviously tilling it in and incorporating it in is, is uh, in the ideal world, probably the best way to go because you're getting it spread throughout that soil. And so you're really changing that soil structure. Um, but just if you can get it right underneath there, it's eventually gonna help work itself down into the system somewhat to a certain extent. Right. You, you gotta be careful with deep tillage too. I kind of forgot about that a little bit. You know, the, your roadside projects, you know, what happens to be in the road right away is all of your small utilities and stuff are fairly shallow to the surface. So if you're doing like behind combo or behind sidewalks and stuff like that, you're going to run into your gas and your power mm -hmm. and your phone and cable and all that fun stuff. So um, you got to be careful with that stuff. Um, but you know, is anything you can do makes things better. The one thing, the one thing that I did see a lot of. So when we, uh, it, it, about six, seven years ago, when I was doing a lot more of this, um, when we put compost directly underneath the sod, one nice thing was that we really extended that um, window. So our watering um, was was required a lot less at that period in time. Um, you really that compost sucked in that moisture, had it there available for the root. And so if you missed kind of that, uh, you know, all of a sudden the sun popped out and it was 90 degrees and you weren't quite there to get the water on it right afterwards, it was nice because you had a little bit more of a buffer in between at that point in time. And, and, it, and it weathered the storm a little bit better or the dry weather a little bit better. Yeah, those terrace seeding projects are, are difficult. Um, I wish the cities were all uniform in terms of their bidding on those. Uh, St. Anthony is probably the best because they break the uh, maintenance and pieces out and the watering out separately. Um, but I think it's a, new, it's a new thing and it's evolving and the engineers have been slow to adopt it and the landscape architecture community too. Um, I don't think knows a lot about terracing as a, you know, as an installation method for stuff. So they don't know to spec it. So you know, being evangelists and getting the word out to people uh, is important. So going off of um, tilling that compost in, um, is that something that the landscape architect company would own or is that is that accessible to to folks? Uh, it's like a landscape contractor, we, you know, we've got all the big tools and equipment and stuff. So we've got tillers on skid loaders and stuff like that and one for smaller one for like our dingo and stuff, but you know, just simple walk behind or uh, your garden mantis tiller type of stuff. That that stuff works. Uh, I 
till compost in my gardens at home uh, instead of digging it all out and bringing the soil in. So I just used a little mantis type of tiller just to just to work it in uh, and make that work. So the the, the big uh, spading machine that Dwayne showed uh, those are all imported out of Europe. So there is a very small pool of contractors that, that do MnDOT work that have have that stuff. Uh, we don't own one. Actually, we don't do a lot of MnDOT work, uh, and they're not cheap. So uh, it's it's one of those specialized tools. If I if I had the ability, I would love to have one. But they're cool. Kayla, I also remember from our last uh, uh, webinar series that we had uh, when we had the City of Egan um, uh, engineer talk. Um, he had said that what they did at the city is they actually went out to a lot of the local um, rental shops and rental stores and, and actually asked them if they'd be willing to kind of carry some of that equipment so that they had the opportunity so they're to tell their contractors, hey, we know this rental shop carries this piece of equipment if you want to go use it and rent it for a certain amount of time. So I think that's a very important piece that uh, uh, is, is, is instrumental in trying to get those, those uh, oh, things put in place and, and workable in, in a system. Got yeah, one tool that we have in our arsenal that uh, Dwayne showed a lot of pictures of uh, one of our competitors, but uh, having a blower truck for applications for uh, compost on slopes or inaccessible sites or things like that, that is a very invaluable tool. Um, and I think it's, you know, very underutilized in uh, this market for what it could truly do and the, you know, uh, truly understanding what the costs are and what the value that that brings to projects, I think is important. Awesome. Yeah, we have a, another question here. Um, and this is uh, wondering, what do you think about customers like local units of government um, to purchase and stage compost that meets their specifications near the project site um, to be blended and used on projects by contractors? Would that be a good idea? Or would there be problems associated with that? Uh, I don't really see an issue with it, uh, as long as there's a really good job on source control and things like that. If they if they can get um, good staging and access and stuff like that for projects, just to avoid all of the time on the road, um, they can save save the project money. Obviously, part of what contractors do is they mark up material, so that's part of you know part of what we need to do to make make it work. So. Um, it's it's an aspect um it'll ch it'll change kind of the the metrics of how people bid but um if if the city's got a good solid source and they've got a good place to stage it and it's centrally located in access for access and things like that i see no, re no reason why that that's not a good especially if they know they have a project coming up and they can get get things kind of prepped ahead of time it's not a bad bad way to look at things I think that looks like that's about it for right now. I, I, we've got about 10 minutes left. I think Ginny, you also had a questionnaire that we wanted to post here. Uh, no, we don't have any, we, we did that last time. We don't have a survey this time. Did do that. But, okay. um, I just wanted to give a little plug for, uh, we are planning a third webinar. Um, right now it's tentatively in July because that's kind of the downtime for composters so we can get a good attendance from most everybody. Um, and uh, we're looking at three speakers uh, this time. Uh, Britt Fawcett, who works for Field Trucks, has committed to speaking. Um, Ron Alexander has committed to speaking. I have a number of topics we could have him speak on, but it sounds like after Dwayne, maybe we should have him speak on the phosphorus papers that he pulled together for the Minnesota Compost Council and do that presentation. He's also doing a project for the Compost Research and Education Foundation that is actually literally writing specifications. Um, that will still be in draft, so we might want to save that until a little later in the year. And then um, Dr. David Crone from uh, UC Riverside, uh, um, University of California Riverside, um, we had a little mix up. 
he was supposed to be one of our speakers this time and uh, we'll be looking at working with him to see if he can speak. So that's kind of the preview of the next one. Be sometime in July, the market development committee has to meet and discuss what's next on the list. So um, that's all I have. Thank you all for attending. We really, really appreciate it. And sorry for the craziness at the beginning. Um, we'll uh, try to figure out the technicalities of that a little bit better this next time. Now that we know what one of the issues was, it should we should be able to get to work a little bit better. So um, any board, Kelly, I see Kelly or Kayla or anybody have any comments? I'm going to pop in here. I know somebody had requested Dane, uh, Dwayne's um, email address, so I'll drop that in the chat. Um, Chad, do you want to share your contact info? Um, yeah, the easiest, easiest place to, to get a hold of me is going to be my email at work here. Okay. Uh, it's just real simple. C and then my last name, B-U-R-A-N, at margolis, M-A-R-G-O-L-I-S-C-O.com. Yeah. And we can put those also in the newsletter. So uh, Michaela, don't let me forget, you and I are gonna be the main architects of that. So <laughs> we got the two of us to remember. Uh, okay, that, I dropped it there in the chat. Look, I forgot the CO after Margolis. Okay, sorry folks, ignore that one. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, Jenny and I will be sending that out. So, um, and then on the website as well, potentially for the, we have, have this recorded, so. It'll, we have it'll be there as well. So. Okay. All right. Thanks. Well, thank you everybody. Have a great afternoon um, and uh, stay warm. <laughs> thank, thank you. you. Bye. All right, bye-bye.